So, let us uh, continue with our discussion on oxygen steel making process. Uh, during the last lecture, uh, I told you that uh, even though uh, oxygen was commercially produced in bulk quantity around 1932, it took almost 20 years uh, for the development of the oxygen steel making process, even though Henry Bessemer was quite aware that by using oxygen one can get you know extremely high quality steel and that too uh, very quickly because the refining rates uh, because of high oxygen relatively high oxygen content would be uh, larger. Now, the initial uh, trials you know uh, were conducted in the Bessemer existing Bessemer converter itself. So, the Bessemer converter if you remember the Bessemer converter uh, had you know it is a pear shaped vessel and uh, it had a lot of two years located at the bottom that is the that is the kind of a design that the Bessemer converter really had. So, you had the lot of uh, two years through which air was injected into the vessel and uh, initially also in the same Bessemer uh, vessel uh, through the two years when attempts were made to blow oxygen uh, disastrous consequences were met the heat produced uh, in the vicinity of the two years because of metal earth reduction reactions <coughs> which are known to be extremely exothermic really you know uh, damage the two year as well as uh, the localized refractories in such a way that almost uh, on a weekly basis uh, the converter required re, uh, relining uh, making it uh, you know not a commercially viable process. So, attempts to blow oxygen from the bottom from the side uh, also you know uh, through a submerged runs nothing produced results because of the intense heat that got generated and damaged the refractory. So, while various uh, you know uh, uh, trial and numerous trials and errors were conducted uh, <coughs> ultimately uh, the breakthrough came when a lance was used, but this lance was away from the metal interface and kept and of course, we would be injecting oxygen and it was realized that even by you know keeping the lance above the surface of the liquid, but blowing oxygen in those days at a near supersonic speed and today of course, we use you know. Uh, certainly Mach number more than 1 or a supersonic oxygen jet. Uh, it was possible uh, to refine steel uh, very expeditiously quite expeditious, expeditious, expeditiously and this region where the oxygen jet would be interacting with <coughs> uh, the metal liquid metal this being quite far away from the refractory lining. So, the heat is going to be locally produced here the, and heat was produced here and this uh, two air is surrounded by refractories. So, the heat was produced in the vicinity of the refractory in this case, but in this case the heat was not produced uh, you know uh, in the vicinity it is quite far away from the refractory uh, lining. So, the refractory really did not get that damaged uh, to that extent. Similarly, since the lens was not submerged inside the melt like the two was exposed to the melt uh, the lens also survived for quite a bit of uh, time. So, this was a paradigm shift that you know without uh, even submerging uh, the injection lens into the melt it is possible to refine uh, in a molten uh, hot metal in the vessel quite expeditiously. So, therefore, <coughs> This was the first you know commercial successful organization and will uh, configuration and we will see why it, it so happens. Uh, now, uh, so that is what was commissioned around 1952 and since then you know in the last 70 years or so uh, it has been you know uh, the development of the oxygen steel making process or which I have yesterday mentioned called the top blown LD steel making process or the top blown, top blowing some people write blown or some people write blowing top blowing oxygen steel making process. Okay. So, 
the story is now well known for the last 70 years significant amount of uh, improvement has gone into the LD converters of 1952 and it has emerged or uh, the LD steel making has process has emerged as a dominant uh, you know steel uh, producing technology throughout the world. Of course, there are several versions several developments uh, which have taken place in the last 70 years that we are going to analyze here. Now, if you remember that I wrote that uh, you know the mass transfer uh, rate is proportional to the rate at which the mass transfer coefficient interfacial area and the delta c the concentration gradient which drives. So, that is the rate rate equation mass transfer coefficient interfacial area and multiplied by the concentration applicable concentration difference and we know how to derive this what is the relevant concentration we will also see when you talk about decarburization that what is the driving force delta c for mass transfer. Now, so therefore, the rate of transport can be improved I have told you categorically by increasing the two things. Now, when you put in oxygen into the bot through into the melt through the two air there is a vigorous amount of melt stirring okay, and quite a bit of enhanced uh, slag uh, you know gas metal interfacial area or slag metal interfacial area because of the stirring presents itself. But when a top lands at a supersonic speed is in you know <coughs> conveyed or advected onto the melt surface then what happens is that we have a huge agitation in the system which causes a significant amount of liquids to be drop you know torn into droplets and suspended in the whole system. So, droplets of iron hot metal you know and slag they would be uh, suspended or ejected and they will constitute a second phase which is if you call it as a bulk melt phase and this is perhaps a mixture of the gas slag and metal and that we will see what sort of a terminology we can foamy slag emulsion etcetera that will introduce later on. So, the bulk in this particular case the only job is was to somehow separate had if there is a slag layer here somehow separate the slag layer such that the metal is exposed to the jet. So, the jet force should be in such a way okay, jet momentum sh should be so much that you could create this opening expose the melt and thereby transfer oxygen and in the process of injecting oxygen at a supersonic speed what you create is a secondary phase here you know a secondary region which exhibits a huge enormous million times more than the planar interfacial area the slag metal gas interfacial area this parameter is increased significantly. So, in the bulk phase the velocity is not that high because from it because the jet is not submerged the momentum transfer is not quite efficient, but uh, because of the large interfacial area what happens is. But this scenario this picture really came much later uh, people were not sure in the beginning that what is the dynamics of the process whatever I have said just now that the increased or fast reaction rate in this particular system LD, LD vessel is not due to an enhanced stirring not due to an enhanced mass transfer coefficient, but because of an significantly enhanced interfacial area between gas slag and metal which has been possible by using this top plant. So, it is not necessary to submerge produce a good amount of stirring. So, there could be because there are two factors which can contribute to the first rate okay, and therefore, uh, you know the by increasing the interfacial area to a significant extent uh, one can expeditiously uh, make steel or refined steel or decarburize uh, the hot metal. So, this as a result so, this, this, this understanding was developed much later when people started analyzing that what is the reason you know uh, what goes inside uh, uh, the LD converter and in that context because seeing what goes on here is very difficult because it is 1600 degrees centigrade and in that context I would say that people have constructed physical models in the laboratory mathematical models in the laboratory to have physical visualization and scientific visualization of what goes inside the reactor and then this you know the dynamic nature of the LD process became more and more clear to the researchers. So, in the 50s and 60s the stop blown oxygen steel making process which is known as the LD steel making process was successfully commercialized and 
this configuration that the lungs will not remain submerged the lungs will use a supersonic oxygen jet was enough to ensure high refining rate because of the increased interfacial area very high quality steel because we are using oxygen there is no scope of nitrogen and also reasonably good or quite good refractory and lungs life okay because this lance is neither submerged the lance is far away from the wall so a good light making the process you know commercially viable. Now several versions of the oxygen steel making process have been developed since 1960s and this essentially are so one is the our classic LD process the top blown process and number two is the LD bath agitation process. Number three is combined top and bottom blown oxygen still making process combined top and bottom blown oxygen still making process and number four is a pure or bottom blowing oxygen steel making process. These are the four popular versions and there are other oxygen steel making processes also which are not quite as popular as these are and of course uh, for example, one such process is called is a Brazilian process called energy optimizing furnace again is an oxygen steel making process, uh, but not so popular this is this is a process which is uh, used mostly in special steel plants or mini mills okay. there are maybe hardly a dozen steel plants uh, using EOF, but oxygen steel making process you know you will find thousands of steel plants throughout the world and of these processes I think today uh, you know. Uh, mostly the combined top and bottom blowing oxygen steel making process and LD bath agitation process are the most important. So, so initial LD process as I have indicated that interfacial area is very large and mass transfer coefficient is not so large because the bulk is not so well stirred because the momentum transfer from the jet to the metal is not quite appreciable. So, by introducing not oxygen, but argon in a very limited amount one could do in start the system and as a result of which or the bulk of the liquid and further expedite the rate of the reaction or efficiency of the process and the bath agitation process introduces or uses argon from the bottom not oxygen from the bottom that you must remember you still have the top blowing oxygen jet okay. So, the configuration of this schematic configuration of this I will draw it like this that we have argon here and the top plants oxygen here that is the schematic configuration of this. On the other hand if you say here okay, that is an LD converter that is an path agitation process. Similarly, you can say that you have a bottom blowing oxygen still making process that is what is the bottom blowing oxygen still making process and accordingly you can configure what is a top and bottom blowing oxygen still making process you put a lance here. So, initially 1950s we did not have good material. So, we could not produce good refractory we could not produce good you know uh, high quality twear, but today there are technologies have been developed it has not just a you know those kind of twears with which initially people have tried to inject. So, quite a bit of thinking has gone into designing the bottom oxygen twear that what should be the two are designed in order to make it sustainable because the characteristics will remain how no matter how you inject oxygen you know whether through a porous plug whether through a two air whether through you know any devices at the bottom in this region intense amount of heat is going to be anyway liberated. So, there is a altogether different design of two years today available through which uh, oxygen is introduced through the bottom we will study this when we will you know, briefly study the bottom blowing oxygen still making uh, process. Given this background now we will like to study the top blown oxygen still making process in detail. Okay.
Let me, what are the major components of the oxygen still making process? The oxygen still making process for example, the major component is the PR shaped refractory vessel which is I will draw it like this. So, that is there is nothing to be injected from the bottom. So, these are uh, refractory lining. So, this is the one component okay. the vessel and the central component of the oxygen LD steel making process and a lance. So, this is oxygen pure oxygen is introduced from the bottom. So, we understand that we will have the vessel, we will have <coughs> a lance, we will require oxygen supply. So, we will have an oxygen plant also located nearby okay? uh, because enormous amount of oxygen is going to be necessary. And what is the oxygen consumption? Oxygen consumption of 2 to 3 uh, normal meter cube per minute per ton of steel. That is the kind of flow rate that people uses. <coughs> and we must understand that when you inject oxygen, this is a normal meter cube, the oxygen is going to undergo a significant amount of volume expansion here. If you take, you know, assume that ideal gas laws are available. So, you can do a temperature correction and pressure correction. So, this volume is not the volume which the liquid metal is going to see. Okay? So, we have it is a shallow bath basically not a very deep bath because of the nature of the momentum transfer. If it is a very deep bath then the bottom part is going to be absolutely quiescent. So, <coughs> this aspect ratio L by D here could be about maximum 0 0.5 or so. And what is L? L is the, at the depth of the liquid. Typical value is about 0 0.35, 0 0.4 I think. So, this is L and D represents the diameter of the vessel. So, you require a pure oxygen uh, in a production unit. You also require material handling, uh, you know. So, you have for example, I would say uh, one component is going to be. So, we will come back to that. Let us let me first talk about uh, the vessel and the lance. This vessel which is a pear shaped vessel and as I have indicated the tip normally the range of the vessel is about 100 tons, very popular range of vessel is about 100 tons and the maximum is about uh, 500 tons. The, this is the kind of steel making vessel which are globally very popular, but there are vessels also which are as big as you know uh, 500 tons, there are vessels also which are about 60 tons and so on and so forth. These are lined with refractory materials and as I have indicated that all steel making processes are now basic steel making processes. So, therefore, the lining material is essentially basic and this basic material essentially is magnesite and tar bonded dolomite. If you concentrate on this area for example, then you will see that you have <coughs> this is the steel shell which is sort of water cooled okay there are panels here and then you have refractory lining which is this so this is the lining here there could be these are refractory bricks for example there could be different type of you know one could be 
a permanent lining, these are all permanent linings and there is a working lining here. So, I would say that this could be visualized as a working lining, working lining. And this is some sort of a permanent lining. You never expose the permanent lining to molten metal. Okay, uh, so it is the working lining, which is inspected time and again. And then, if should there be a need, then repairing of the work, working lining, etc. Is done. There are also, you know, different materials in between the layers of refractories, and this could be a feet thick, you know, because it is 1600 degree outside temperature and the inside temperature and the outside temperature could be as small as 300, 400 degrees centigrade or so. So, therefore, huge temperature gap is there. So, therefore, the resistance offered by the refractory to heat is enormous and the refractory also has to you know withstand various kinds of requirements as we will see here. For example, in this particular region, the slag may be quite high okay? and the slag contains FeO as we all know and FeO is very corrosive to the basic slags to magnesite as well as star bonded dolomite. So, we have also here you know cardboards and glass holes etcetera with which the joints are reinforced because the bricks are going to expand when they are going to be heated and these cardboards etcetera asbestos etcetera they are you know they <coughs> give adjustment to the thermal expansion contraction of the bricks. Initially the refractory when the vessel is freshly relying. Uh, typically the temperature remains much on the smaller lower side, but then after about you know 5 or 7 days of operation continuous operation, then the refractory layer attains a steady state temperature configuration, because it is tapping making one and you know, a converter can be used to make you know something like uh, 22 hits a day, which essentially means every hour you are you know charging hot metal and then blowing it. So, therefore, it does not have a chance to cool down to a drastically different temperature. There may be 20, 30 degrees fluctuation of the shell temperature, but not beyond that. We also must understand that by reinforcing the brick layers with additional insulating materials like glass wool, asbestos, etcetera, while it gives us an opportunity to adjust the expansion and contraction of the brick. Okay? So, this is what it is. It also offers additional thermal resistances, which you know from our heat transfer theories, which you call as a contact thermal resistance. Okay? And as a result of which what happens, the temperature across the joint or across this you know, asbestos or, or, or the cardboard layers drops much more significantly uh, because of the associated thermal uh, contact resistance between the two layers of. So, multiple contact thermal resistances are going to be encountered from here to here, which will give rise to additional uh, temperature drop. So, coming back to the requirement. So, this is as I said and this is this is the semi permanent as well as permanent lining permanent lining and the yellow one as I have indicated is uh, our steel shell which is the vessel is mounted on trunnions and it is such way that the vessels can be tilted towards you or towards me in order to facilitate you know charging of hot metal as well as draining of hot metal. We have a tap hole here and through that tap hole the molten metal and the slag are going to be drained out. The vessel is this lance is a retractable lance that means lance you can remove and lower at your will. This is decided by the operator when the blowing is over, he just lifts it and once the lance lifts, then you can rotate the vessel you know either in this direction towards you or in the reverse direction. Of course, you cannot because it is mounted on this axis, so the rotation is possible along this axis itself, vertical axis itself. So, the brick materials that we use to line the you know vessel, uh, which is basic in nature, okay, uh, this brick material. Uh, are not uniform. In blast furnace also we have seen that we use mostly fire clay bricks if you remember except the bottom hearth where you use carbon refractories. Uh, I said that you know this is not the same uh, fire clay material or same composition of the fire clay material that will be used from the top to the bottom. Towards the bottom part 
where in the Bosch region where we have more intense you know carbon monoxide concentration as well as high temperature they are possibly a relatively more concentration relatively more you know uh, alumina in the fire clay uh, is going to be desirable because it offers uh, high refractoriness. So, a furnace is not lined you know uh, with the same material all through and it is this vessel LD vessel is also not an exception ok. Bottom region in the bottom if you look at the bottom for example, in the bottom the bottom cross section will look something like this and where you will have. So, this is our you know bottom shell and this is our refractory ok and then we have So, this is our refractory and this is the opening part and the bottom refractory if you see the shell ok. If you, if you take a section here for example, that is what you are going to see. So, that is the section A A and this is the top view A A prime and this is the top view of the section. So, you can see the shell and then you can see the bottom and the bottom refractory is also you know if you, if you look at like this if I draw it differently and then you have different kinds of bricks at the bottom and all the bricks do not have the same kind of a characteristics because when you would be charging the scrap solid scrap the scrap may heat in certain regions ok and you know that and these regions could be really laid with a brick which has a greater impact resistance than the surrounding brick etcetera. Okay. Similarly, this part which is exposed to the slag layer which contains the corrosive agent FeO, FeO by the way is a uh, you know slag eater uh, you know refractory eater. So, it is the most other constituents calcium oxide etcetera uh, are you know which is in high amount these are friendly to the basic compounds because magnesium magnesite and tarbon dolomite etcetera are not too different from CaO. So, they are all uh, you know <coughs> basic of basic materials. Uh, refractory. So, therefore, uh, the refractory and the slag as far as calcium content and MgO content are concerned uh, you know they are not hostile to each other, but on the other hand more and more if your content of the slag is going to react with uh, the, uh, the refractory lining and damage it and it is well known that if you tends to impregnate into <coughs> the refractory layer and damages you know there is a huge amount of corrosion goes on. Refractories by the way if you know uh, refractories get eroded in steel making their uh, uh, conditions uh, due to three different mechanisms. One we call as a thermal degradation, the other we call as a hydrodynamic degradation and the third we call it as a chemical degradation. Chemical degradation means there is a reaction of the refractories with the surrounding thermal because there are going to be high temperature and in the high temperature. Uh, refractories ok their strength may be a little bit lo low or the, if the refractories are you know temperature fluctuates quite a bit that you, you use you make steel then you in the next day uh, you just make one hit and then you do a next hit uh, the other day that means there is a thermal fatigue in the refractory. So, all these are these are the reasons for thermal degradation of the refractory and there is a hydrodynamic degradation also because when the fluid flows past the refractory ok there are shear stresses which are going to be generated on the refractories that can give rise to also wear and tear of the refractory. But by far in metallurgical systems ok there may be a localized region for example, if the molten metal you know strikes at a certain point here if it falls here if you can imagine if you are you know suppose if, if you think of you know a bucket uh, under a tap and then you you know open the bucket when it is initially empty then possibly at the point of impact on the floor of the bucket you know uh, there could be large amount of shear stress generated because of the momentum of the impinging stream. Same is the scenario here also, but barring that throughout the other region of the vessel for example, here the flows are going to be not that strong to cause a large amount of wall shear stress. So, by far in most of the cases uh, the wear of refractory of course, is assisted by I would say thermal and hydrodynamic phenomena but chemical wear of the refractory happens to be the dominant mechanism of refractory wear and refractory wear is important why because refractory is expensive you know for example if you try to increase the alumina content of a refractory its cost is going to skyrocket at the you know extreme end 
So therefore, you never use pure alumina, you cannot use, you cannot afford pure alumina. So you use aluminum silicate, calcium aluminum silicate and so on and so forth and that brings in certain impurity that you know, so it is a, a compromised solution uh, basically uh, for using the refractory material even though you would like to use I know if, uh, if you make alumina purely cheap I would like to use you know uh, more alumina in the refractory uh, than it is possible okay? or pure magnesia uncontaminated magnesia which is going to be you know magnesia extracted from sea water going to be horrendously expensive. So, this, uh, these are not pure phases for example, even though I have write written magnesite does not mean that it is pure magnesite. Okay? So, there are other compounds into it predominantly 80 percent could be magnesia and so on and so forth or 70 percent could be magnesia and so on and so forth. So, therefore, in this region we have to design the refractory such that the refractory material remains relatively inert to FeO. So, what I mean to say that refractories have specific purposes region specific purposes. So, therefore, although we will say that we will not line the material vessel with any acidic refractories basic refractories, but the, there will be subtle variations in the composition of the basic refractories in order to meet uh, diverse objectives that the vessel must offer during the steel making process. Coming to the lens now, the lens is basically a steel tube you can consider it. But it is also a water cooled structure because there is going to be intense amount of heat here and you can imagine that uh, when carbon oxygen reaction can take place you know the carbon monoxide is going to escape and maybe you know unutilized oxygen can react with carbon monoxide and produce locally heat. So, the lens is going to be also subjected to a hostile thermal and chemical environment within the oxygen still making vessel and it is important for us to ensure good amount of <coughs> you know life to the lens. This lens is not as I have shown here, today's lens are multi hole lens, they are a vertical tube through which oxygen will be blown into the converter, but these are not single hole lens, we have three hole, four hole, six hole lenses and their objective only is to distribute oxygen over a larger area. Now, this lens for example, as I have indicated they are retractable, they can bring you can bring it closer to the surface, you can take it away from the surface and the lens uh, has uh, you know basically it is water cooled. So, it has uh, its own cooling mechanism, but most importantly as I have indicated that we create you know a slag metal droplets here and the lens that the lens is water cooled. So, you can imagine that the surface of the lens is going to be maybe you know a quite a bit lower, lower, uh, low temperature. So, a lower surface temperature of the lens due to water cooling will cause that since you have innumerable droplets of slag metal suspended here, some of this which will come in contact with the uh, cold surface or the relatively you know cold surface of the lens due to water cooling of course, uh, they will try to re-solidify and as a result of which the lens which may be initially look like this the cross section and the lens may look you know after some time and what is this? This is the we call is a lens curl okay? and this curling material actually protects the lens itself and what is this? These are nothing but solidified iron solidified slag layer and entrapped within it going to be you know some voids which corresponds to the various gaseous particle itself. So, this is the two different mechanisms work simultaneously to protect the lens. This is this distorts the outer geometry which is of no consequence to us, but it plays a very important role. So, this is the skull and the phenomena is called the lens uh, sculling. In addition to oxygen lens, there is also a terminology that you will see which you call as a sub lens in the system. The sub lens is not to be confused with the lens and the sub lens is not for oxygen injection, the sub lens is for taking the melt samples. So, it will you know collect melt samples which can be analyzed, which will sense, it is a sensor basically you know which can sense the carbon content of the melt temperature of the molten and so on and so forth. These also can be immersed and then taken out at will and these are very important aspect. Apart from this, now let us go and see 
what other things we require and as I have indicated that you will find that basically we have <coughs> A huge hood connected here and then the hood is going to be you know. So, this is the entire <coughs> such that the suction is there. So, the suction is going to draw whatever is going to be <coughs> suction is you know never so strong that whatever droplets are ejected here you will you know they are well calculated the fan speed etcetera are well calculated such that the exhaust you know the gas which leaves out here and the particulates they do not it is a, a little bit you know uh, <coughs> lower pressure not too low a pressure which will be created here such that the exhaust gas you know with suspended uh, small suspended particles uh, could be. Uh, drawn and treated. So, this is how the off gas is treated. In the. So, there is you require an oxygen plant. So, let us list what we all need. Okay. So, we have a converter the components of the shop converter we have lungs we have a gas cleaning plant we have O2 supply plant. we have raw material or feed handling facility we have product handling facility we have many sensors and process control equipments. And most importantly you will see that if you go to an LD shop nobody is there in front of the converter. Okay? There is an LD control room an air conditioned room with huge size consoles which we are show which would show you the schematic the lens position okay time of blow how much of oxygen have blown all these kinds of things are going to be seen dynamically as the process is going on so we have a control room where you will find that the operators and engineers it is not you know as extensive or as big as a you know blast furnace, uh, blast furnace paraphernalia is there much more, uh, but so it does not require also that big a space as the blast furnace does. Uh, and here, what you can see that these are uh, the essential components converter, lens, I have described gas cleaning plant, which they will say. Now, fit regarding this fit handling capabilities, we must understand that we have hoppers here and through these hoppers okay, we have shoots through which molten metal I would draw this possibly as a broken line that is better. Okay. So, suppose you want to add limestone you want to add DRI. So, you have charging facilities. So, onto these hoppers those materials there is not just one hopper there is going to be several hoppers one will contain maybe scrap the other will contain DRI the third will contain dolomite the fourth will contain lime and so on and so forth and this allows us one need not go there the operator you know sitting in the control room can control. Okay. They will not only control that what is monitored the weight through load cells they will not only control that what is the pressure of oxygen and how much of oxygen has been blown they will also control that what time what reactants to be fed into the system. So, these are the basically uh, the uh, components of uh, the system and let us now see very quickly that how a heat is going to be started. 
when we will you know start to uh, operate it. So, typical and this entire thing as I said you can consider this to be this is to be at the ground level ok and this is if I have if you have missed it this is our tap hole. We will study the tapping operation it is very important and then we will see that when it is tilted ok the molten metal uh, you know can be drained through the tap hole <coughs> into a uh, ladle uh, typically which is a cylindrical shaped vessel. So, we will say that the entire thing here is uh, you know something like you can say this is the this is the below the ground you know this is this is could be at a first floor level something you know much elevated height and this tells us that it can be rotated this way or that way. And on this floors you know you will have carts which are going to be there on which you can have lot of material in which can be charged into the system scrap carrying car etcetera. So, this is below the floor level this does not mean it goes gone below the ground ok. This is the floor level it could be you know say the roof of this particular room and that is the way the converter is going to look like. And also it is here that you can below it when you when you turn it you know the below it is going to be on the ground level. Uh, the, so, if, it, if this is the ground level on this side you can have a little for draining of molten metal and on this side you can have you know the slack parts. So, this is our ground level this is our ground level. So, we will tilt it completely and then you know fill so this will call as a slack pot and this is little. So, one side you will tilt first you tilt you drain out the metal then you tilt in the reverse side and then you take out the slack and then you make the converter vertical again ok. And now once the converter is made vertical now let us follow one typical heat to make you understand that in the shop floor what is being done in order to make steel. <coughs> so, once the converter is vertical and it is ready we must also understand before I think I would draw one particular point that a blast furnace as you know that it could be producing a huge amount of material and as I said that if you have three and a half million ton blast furnace ok and annual production is 3.5 million ton blast furnace. So, it is like you know you are producing three three point six million tons per annum this is the tons and you are on a daily basis roughly about 10,000 tons per day that is what is going to be daily production from a 3.5 million ton plus furnace 9500 to 10,000 tons of hot bottle per day. And as I said this is just 300 tons converter 400 tons converter. So, even if it does on a daily you know 24 uh, hits a day every hour one hit this one converter is not going to be enough to handle uh, one large or giant blast furnace producing 10,000 tons. So, in an integrated steel mill which has such a massive size blast furnaces ok there is going to be not just one converter, but several converters would be there 3, 4, 5 converters would be there. And we must understand that the converter lining is going to undergo some damage at some point of time the working lining may get completely dislodged or you know uh, deteriorated uh, making the vessel vulnerable. So, therefore, it is to be taken for relining. So, if you have 5 vessel at any point of time may be one or two vessel are undergoing relining. So, you effectively have three vessels which are operating simultaneously. So, a number of oxygen steel making vessels power blast furnace is going to be there in the steel making shop that you must uh, remember ok. 
So, once the converter is made vertical, let us come back. Okay. The first job is that the inspection is done, whether the lining is all right or not, should it repair some, uh, should, should, is there some damage done already to the refractory. Uh, today, there are robot robotic arms. One earlier people used to watch them through blue glasses, but today the scanning of the refractory service you know in advanced and good steel plants or modern day steel plants are done you know uh, through automated devices robotic eyes etcetera are there. And then also the repair work is done not manually because you know it is radiating heat you just emptied it, it treated a steel it is treated steel at 1600 degree centigrade. So, therefore, you can expect. Uh, that you know it is not possible to physically go and repair it. So, there are going to be robotic arms which are going to be repairing it. So, once repairing is done inspection and repairing is over. So, now it is and the sintering is instantaneous because of the high temperature involved there. So, the vessel is made ready and the first thing that is going to be charged is the scrap. The scrap is heavier you must understand scrap is pure iron, pure iron has a density of about 7800 kg per meter cube. On the other hand steel depending on its carbon content has a lower density a very you know uh, uh, medium carbon grade steel uh, may have a density of about 7200 kg per meter cube and so. So, there is a some difference. So, the scrap is in general heavier and it is much heavier than the hot metal because the hot metal contains 4.3 percent carbon. So, the scrap is charged and as I have indicated that the scrap may impact when the furnace is empty at the bottom and this is now red hot bottom okay. and so therefore, it is relatively weak. So, therefore, the bottom refractories has to be very good. One scrap is charged and then you have hot metal feeding. And hot metal feeding depending on the practice this could be about 70 to 90 percent of hot metal to be charged into the furnace that is the typical kind of a variations. Once you charge hot metal and charging of scrap charging of hot metal they are all done when the converter is in the tilted position. Okay. So, inspection converter is made horizontal through a robotic arm you can now see from the control room. Now, the control room and the opening of the converter they are collinear. So, from the convert you know Con, uh, room uh, control room itself one should be able to see it visually without interfering. Similarly, at that horizontal position of the converter the scrap is added at that horizontal position itself you know from ladle or it is not perfectly horizontal maybe semi horizontal or tilted position the hot metal is going to be charged from the ladle. So, the this converter is going to be tilted through an overhead crane the ladles containing 250 300 tons of ladle all metal will come the crane will lower it till the ladle and that is how the molten metal is going to go inside. You know it looks very simple, but you must understand that the converter is now empty and once the converter is empty you have pouring molten metal where maybe you know in 5 minutes time you will finish uh, pouring. So, could be 60 tons per minute that is the rate at which you are putting in. So, you can imagine how much of gaseous material etcetera you know which is contained in the system uh, will come out. Okay. Uh, so, huge amount of the, the pouring process itself can generate huge amount of dust unless and until you have a good suction available in the plant to you know uh, aspirate uh, the gas which is coming out uh, or the particulates which are coming out from uh, the empty converter itself. Anyway, so once you have fed in the hot metal and the scrap at that particular moment the converter is turned and it is made vertical. Once the converter becomes vertical the retractable lens is now lowered and blowing is started. We must understand at this particular point the hot metal has come from the blast furnace, it has undergone pretreatment. So, there could be some drop in the temperature of the hot metal itself. So, if you have you know charge it uh, if you have if you have tapped a blast furnace in a hot metal at 1400 degrees centigrade by the time we bring it here uh, it is uh, now could be 1380 degrees centigrade depending on the extent of 
you know, time to travel as well as uh, the kind of pretreatment operations that one has done 20, 25, 30 degrees temperature drop is not unlikely at all. And therefore, the moment hot metal is poured and the converter is made vertical, okay, the next job and the converter is also now a little cold and particularly in the initial period when the converter has just been commissioned, the converter inside temperature is you know could be wall temperature, refractory wall temperature could be 1200 degree, could be 1100 degree centigrade. So, it is not that hot. So, the moment you put hot metal, bring the furnace in the vertical position, your next job is to blowing of oxygen. At that stage after putting hot metal, you cannot just add limestone, you cannot add DRI because these are solid material at room temperature, they will consume heat and as a result of which you know the entire operation is going to be jeopardized. So, blowing of oxygen starts. The moment you start blowing, then the game starts. Okay? Then oxidation of the impurity starts, if you oxidizes, silicon oxidizes, iron oxide silicate forms and this forms within first 30 seconds of the blow itself. And as a result of which temperature rapidly shoots up and it is at that particular time what happens? You add the solid additions. If you want to improve yield, you may add DRI if you want and you know you will obviously acting lime and as temperature more and more FeO forms, more and more silica forms, lime starts to progressively dissolve because the temperature and you can imagine the vigorosity of stirring, you know the agitation we are injecting a supersonic jet here, the solid liquid gas you know it is an horrendously complex and intensely starts situation which is chemically extremely active. No? And when you add this solid addition and as a result of which what happens is the slag volume increases, the refining reaction proceeds. And then after some time what happens is you now want to a certain kick, where have I come? You know, what is the stage of the blowing? So, the sub lens is going to be immersed, you will collect samples and you will do sampling. Sub lens will allow you to continuously monitor. On the other hand, if you do it manually, it will take some time, you know, to get the analysis report. And the sampling will tell you when the end point has come, when the desired carbon level has been achieved, and it is at that time you stop blow. And what you do? Let me write it at the top. Number seven is going to be that you are going to. When the sampling is correct, you are going to tilt the furnace, and you have reached the required point, and then the tapping operation, tapping and product disposal. So, these are the sequence in which the operation is done and tapping you will do it in two stages, one side is metal, the other side is slag and again you make the converter vertical and then the same sequence of operation uh, repeats. So, we will continue with our discussion in the next lecture. So, having given you uh, the characteristics of uh, a, a given heat that the sequence of operation in a given heat, uh, let us now look at uh, the physical chemical characteristics of the LD process. Let us now peep inside the vessel during the blow, because what about the seven points that I have written in my last during my last lecture, I think the most important is to understand now once the blowing has started and various kinds of uh, you know, uh, chemical processes have resulted uh, in the system. So, let us try to understand and that will help us to get a complete picture of the dynamics uh, of the oxygen steel making process. Let us understand. Uh, so, this is our vessel which I have drawn during the last lecture. It stays on the blackboard. Okay. And so, this is the and I am for the sake of simplicity, I am issued not a you know uh, multiple hole nozzle. Uh, only thing here is you can see that uh, if, you, if you draw the section there, if you have a single hole nozzle, this possibly will represent uh, the impact area. On the other hand, if you have a multiple nozzle, so then you have you know somewhere like this could be all impact area. That is you know, it will cover much bigger area of impact. So, this is a multi hole nozzle 
there may not be that much that kind of a sharp uh, demarcation between the impact areas, but schematically speaking uh, that is you know multi, -ho multi hole runs will give you a much bigger, uh, but the intensity with which the oxygen is going to be you know the depression in the cavity possibly is going to be not as strong as it is uh, in the case of a single hole nozzle. So, for the sake of you know uh, easiness of our understanding. So, I will draw the nozzle, nozzle and the nozzle because we have it is a horizontal nozzle. Okay. So, the gas is flowing it is a flow through a tube and basically it is uh, a convergent divergent nozzle. Okay. So, you have you know there is tapering and then there is expansion. So, it is the cross section is not so and that uh, gives rise to some kind of uh, an additional cooling you know because of the Joule Thomson effect uh, which I guess you are aware of. So, the oxygen is blown here and here what happens is we have uh, basically this is the orifice through which the gas is released and we have uh, this is the characteristics of the O2 jet. The jet at the orifice at this cross section is supersonic does not mean that the jet is going to be supersonic downstream, because the jet any jet the characteristics of a jet is what the jet entrains the medium from the surrounding and as a result of which the jet diameter increases as I have tried to indicate here that is how the jet diameter is increasing. It is several times now at this cross section it is several times the orifice diameter and because the diameter is increased okay, the continuity of flow requires uh, that the velocity through this construction is going to be substantially smaller than the velocity through this construction. So, the jet when it strikes the surface if it is, it is supersonic here supersonic this is at this impact region the jet is going to be subsonic. Although there is a supersonic core of the jet supersonic core. The center one the you know, red one that we have drawn here is a supersonic core, but that by the time it impacts the mold you know unless the jet is very close to the surface uh, the metal sees a subsonic jet striking, but that itself is you know uh, maybe 0 0.6 0 0.5 Mach number. So, it is quite a intense uh, you know jet strikes the surface with a quite, quite intense uh, actual momentum. And as a result of which what happens is the jet because of this the jet entrains the surrounding and you can imagine now that by lowering this impact area if this represents my melt surface this is the plane of my the lance nozzle. Okay. And this is the bath surface. You can imagine that this distance by lowering the lance, moving the lance this way, or in this case, what happens is by moving the lance up and down, this impact area can be changed quite a bit. And you can now physically visualize that this jet, when it strikes the bath, it causes a depression here. Okay. And you have added some material. Uh, 5 minutes after the initial blow. So, the slag has formed. So, because of this the flow takes place gas takes place something like this. This is the characteristics of the flow and as a result of which you know the downcoming jet as it impacts the bath it creates it separates the slag layer exposing the molten metal uh, you know uh, to the pure oxygen jet and as a result of which there is a gas metal contact and the dissolution of oxygen is extremely rapid and so is the reaction the moment the metal sees the gas okay what we see what we can you know uh, expect the quite a bit of iron oxide and uh, carbon as well as silicon are going to be oxidized in this particular region. So, there is a potentially very high temperature zone in this particular 
scenario. And initially, when LED trial was successful, people thought that this high temperature actually drives. This is the impact here and high temperature and you know that is basically the reason for um, the expeditious rate of the steel making process. It took quite some time to develop that this jet as it flows like this the way I have indicated these actually tears of the slag and droplet particles and they are thrown uh, you know even if you see that you know even a water jet when it flows through a filled bucket you can see how many uh, how many droplets are ejected and in this case when a gas which is much lighter strikes with enormous momentum at the liquid surface you can imagine that how many droplets are going to be you know millions of droplets are going to be uh, because of the shearing action simply the gas is moving this way so there is a huge shearing force acting you know upon the liquid which will take the droplets of slag and metal and then suspend them so they will have a flight time here they are going to be so the gas as similarly here if you can say oxygen plus carbon no carbon dioxide is important carbon dioxide cannot form at that temperature and <coughs> carbon monoxide is evolving gas is evolving and this gas there are droplets I am just drawing in one side. So, there are droplets of slag and droplets of metal red ones they are going to be ejected they are not going to be discrete they are going to be actually mixed slag metal droplets intently mixed, but they are going to be you know all sorts of size ranges small size bigger size and bigger size particles will not stay too long okay? they are going to be ejected and immediately fall down because of the gravity. So, it is smaller size particles okay? smaller size droplets only within a narrow size range that one can see in the above the bath surface. So, that is what is going to be created and there is going to be the gas is going to be evolving and we can have a gas curtain around the nozzle this is possibly the gas evolving from the system. <coughs> and then you can imagine that if you lower the lungs and you know if, if, if the lungs tip is here possibly you will not see any droplet which is being generated. If the lance is going to be very close to the surface you will see that the impact area is going to be very very small, but there may be going to be huge amount of droplets which may be forming. So, the lance height you know is a very important parameter process parameter during the whole blow and the operator controls it in order to control that how much of droplets are going to be there at what area you know he has to uh, supply the gas and so on and so forth. So, when the lance is brought to a very close close to the surface very close to the surface then we say it is a very hard blow okay? and that hard blow will give rise to enormous amount of uh, droplets to be ejected here. Uh, the cavity depth is going to be very strong, but the surface area of the cavity is not going to be. So, this is the cavity that is what we talk about the depression because of the impingement of the oxygen jet. So, when the blow is very hard in that case the depression is going to be you know the cavity is going to look like something like this that is a hard blow cavity. On the other hand if you have a low you know low uh, soft blow when soft blow means you have retracted the lance uh, vertically upwards there is a significant amount of distance and then possibly you can see that the depression the cavity will have a configuration like this. So, the surface area exposed is very large, but on the other hand you know uh, the gas has lost quite a bit of momentum you will not be able to generate. Uh, <coughs> and this will determine that initially for example, you you will you know in the first minute of the blow you, you have to make you have to blow it hard. So, that the slag separates out or you know when some slag has uh, some slag has formed a few SiO2 etcetera that the slag separates out oxygen is going to be a, a, you know directly um, uh, impinging onto the surface. So, you want to you know cover a large area so that the gas metal contact area uh, increases substantially expediting uh, the dissolution of oxygen into the belt itself and that will you know subsequently give rise to uh, quite a bit of iron oxide uh, iron oxidation as well as carbon monoxide oxidation carbon oxidation uh, giving uh, you know or producing very large uh, temperature. So, the lance height is a very important parameter and as a result of which 
what we can see that the supersonic core, the tip of the supersonic core may come very close to the cavity surface or may not and therefore, the intensity of agitation, but you must understand that no matter what you do in the bulk of the liquid, you will not be able to produce much stirring even the cavity is going to be large. So, the top phase, the upper phase which is a mixture of gas droplets, uh, uh, slag droplets, metal droplets and gaseous you know all three phases mixed, the dynamics of that phase can be controlled and you know that you cannot really put it too close or inside the milk because in that case you have to make a compromise about the life of the lance itself. So, the life lance has to be above the bath uh, all the time. Okay, rarely it is going to be or never it is going to be submerged and we must understand that the transfer of momentum from an impinging gas jet into the metal is not that efficient and therefore, the bulk of the liquid will not be stirred. It is the upper phase characteristics that can be controlled much more significantly by altering the lance height than the bulk intensity of bulk motion in the intensity of motion in the bulk of the liquid steel uh, or uh, you know, the refined hot metal itself. So, once you have uh, you have started to blow oxygen into the system, the oxidation reactions will start to take place and as I have indicated that uh, we can have you know extremely rapid oxidation of iron ore, uh, iron as well as carbon. Now, if you look at the carb you know metalloid oxidation as a function of time, let us consider a period of 20 minutes of blow 5, 10, 15 and 20 and blowing period typically you know hit to hit time may be you know 30 to 50 minutes everything would be over. I mean 20 minutes is blowing time then comes tapping then comes repairing. So, heat may take about 30, 35 minutes you know, but the exact blowing time is 20 minutes and that is what I want to show 5, 10 this is time minutes 15. 20. And then we can see that uh, we have the carbon typically if this is the desired carbon. So, we can say that is the kind of a carb that one sees for carbon. On the other hand if you see silicon the silicon carb. So, it is a metalloid x, what is x? x represents the metalloid dissolved in molten iron or hot metal, uh, x could be carbon, x could be silicon and you can see that the silicon possibly will go something like this. This is at lower because we know this value of silicon is about 1 weight percentage while this value of x is about uh, 4.3 or 4.5 weight percentage and so on. So, this really gives rise to that the, within the first 3 minutes or 4 minutes, the silicon oxidation and carbon oxidation produces enormous amount of heat and you will see that at that particular point. Okay, so, I you can draw that how this is the melt phase control, melt phase, melt composition simultaneously the slack composition is also changing okay the slack composition is changing slack composition and the slack initially the slack similarly if you have time here the slack typically will not contain any and this is calcium oxide progressively calcium oxide is going to be dissolving in the slag and as a result of which silica will be increasing and then it is going to be decreasing wet percentage silica. Okay. So, this is 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Why it is decreasing? Because the slag is now containing more and more lime. Uh, so, the relative proportion of silica because after 5 minutes there is no more silica, silicon has been oxidized, but because the pro content of lime is continuously increasing, basicity is increasing. So, relative proportion of silica in the slag, this is the wet percentage values that we are talking about, wet percentage. So, the wet percentage wise the silica concentration starts to decrease and 
the iron oxide content you know it initially it increases, but it fluctuates quite a bit. So, therefore, I would say that it hmm, looks like something like it fluctuates and then towards the end. So, because why it decreases iron oxide you know it is initially increasing lime has dissolved and lime has started to replace iron oxide FeO from SiO2. Okay. So, FeO is now reverting back to the metal phase and as a result of which relative FeO content in the slag is decreasing and also because the relative CO content is increasing, but come towards the end of the blow as I have indicated when the carbon content you can come to in a very low level you can consider that this is about 15 minutes and this is about you know 15 and this is 20 and here you can see that by 15 minutes the carbon has fallen down to the 1 weight percentage or less than that and because of that what happens is you now have your blowing oxygen oxygen does not see any carbon. So, as a result of which if you increases significantly in all this process the oxygen value in the melt also increases quite a bit and to be consistent with the FeO value this is FeO this is SiO2 what we are going to see that the dissolved oxygen content is going to increase and as FeO content builds up in the slag okay, very rapidly in the later phase so does the dissolved oxygen content. And what is this value of dissolved oxygen content this is could be about 600 to 700 ppm. Because they are all in different axis so I am not putting in the you know the values here and the final FeO content this value of FeO this value the standard one you know could be about 15 to 25 percent FeO that could be possible in the system. And of course, if one superimposes temperature the temperature will also be following a similar trend like the dissolved oxygen it is going to be continuously increasing. So, this is my silicon and the hot metal and this is the carbon. <coughs> And at that particular point about 5 minutes or so you know you have quite a bit of lime has dissolved not all your basicity is not yet 4 your basicity is going to be you know 4 somewhere here basicity is maybe 1.52 or something like that. So, we would expect that the dephosphorization rate is not going to be dephosphorization is not going to be very very large. Okay. Dephosphorization scale could be different, but I will superimpose because the phosphorus content is 0.1 percent. I cannot draw it here, then this will be too small. So, let us you know use a different scale for phosphorus, a separate scale for phosphorus, just to show that this is this one is the phosphorus scale, and this is for all other metallurgies. And the phosphorus content will show something like you know. something like this. So, I would say right from the beginning itself the phosphorus is going to be phosphorus is decreasing some way because the temperature is now still low the, the basicity is there the moment the lime starts to dissolve and you know. So, there is some amount of phosphorus uh, elimination initially for maybe you know half a minute or one minute when the FeO is there SiO2 is there the slag is acidic there is no removal, but barring the first half minute then continuously the phosphorus uh, starts to. <coughs> and we must see that the phosphorus removal is completed you know ahead of uh, the carbon removal itself that is what this particular figure essentially indicates. And in this particular case also you can see that we can say that roughly speaking uh, this if I draw it so that then it is easier for us to visualize. So, this is a period in which more or less a straight line period straight line can be drawn. What does this indicate that from here to here the carbon concentration you know barring this part okay, between this two point A and B the carbon concentration can be assumed to be following almost a linear pattern which essentially means that this is a period of steady state decarbonization. The rate at which carbon because straight line has a sing, sing, you know constant slope. So, if the curve can be approximated the slope evaluated at all these points and the slope is what dc over dt where c represents the concentration of carbon. So, this is a period of steady state. So, initially 
the rate is increasing then a constant value of rate is obtained decarburization rate and finally as you can see the slope of the line will be changing so the decarburization rate will fall down as a function of time till you obtain the process. So, silicon is clear and we remember you try to visualize the thermodynamics of the reactions that I have uh, discussed uh, you know when I was talking about the principles of steel making process first 3 minutes silicon has great affinity towards oxygen silicon gets oxidized uh, and the phosphorus removal becomes very rapid you know particularly during this period of time as you can see here because now you have a very basic slag you have from here to here you are talking about large amount of lime you know the temperature carbon is getting carbon is also removed quite a bit okay there is not much reducing atmosphere the molten metal has contains there is some FeO value in the slag itself oxidizing power is good and conditions are favorable that gives rise to. Now, we must understand that the phosphorus removal phosphorus is a what I said is a slag metal reactions and where is the slag and the metal here the slag metal reaction is taking place in this particular phase it is here that the slag metal reactions are taking place and this phase where you have droplets this is you know we call it a slag metal emulsion. So, try any droplets of metal embedded in a slag matrix. So, that is what is the meaning of an emulsion or a definition of an emulsion. So, and here what happens is we have an enormous as I have indicated when I wrote the equation uh, for you know mass transfer uh, rate uh, that it the rate is a function of the interfacial area and we said that the slag metal the velocity is not so high here and it is a large interfacial area that drives. Now, this large interfacial area the slag metal gas interfacial area uh, which is there now what happens is this droplets do not try to collapse the droplets because there is a carbon monoxide gas which is moving up okay, that tends to give some kind of a buoyant action to the gas. So, there is a lifting kind of a scenario which helps the droplets to remain you know iron droplets iron is what 3 times more or 2.5 times more heavier than the slag. So, iron droplets has a and basically the moment the iron droplet you know is reduced it will automatically come down because its density is going to be larger. So, somehow to create a very large slag metal interfacial area we want this eruption emulsion to not collapse and you can imagine that emulsion cannot be created for example, if the lance is taken to up the emulsion cannot be created if you blow too little oxygen or the oxygen is not blown at a supersonic speed. So, emulsion is going to be created first condition is there that we have to have a slag develop we have to have gas move upwardly moving gas like carbon monoxide evolving in the system. So, some carbon content of the bath and carbon monoxide generation is important and then of course, you know the lance adjustment etcetera are very very important parameter that will cause because it is the emulsion phase creation of the emulsion that ensures only that you have a huge interfacial area and therefore, large rate of slag metal reactions. So, therefore, as you can see here in this particular graph during the steady state decarburization period okay, we have enormous amount of continuous rate carbon monoxide is being evolving and because of the shearing actions the droplets are also going to be ejected. Let us look at one of these droplets which is ejected in a large. So, this droplet is and these droplets now contain what these droplets is surrounded by slag it may not be homogeneously or no coherently surrounded, but there will be slag metal contact for example. So, this is our droplet and these droplets contain carbon monoxide also in it. So, the slag metal contact area is very very large and as a result of which what happens is we can have the slag metal reaction like uh, dissolved carbon okay, and uh, if you that can take place producing carbon monoxide and if you also okay, the dissolved oxygen oxygen dissolving into it into the droplets okay, this can go inside and in inside carbon oxygen reaction can also take place dissolved carbon dissolved. If the droplets you know if gases are generated okay at the interfaces 
all within the bulk of this droplet, you can understand that the droplet volume is now going to be increasing okay? and because it has a, it, it contains a carbon monoxide bubble entrapped in between. So, as a result of which what happens is the droplet experiences some kind of a buoyancy. I would say that the droplet density during the flight and that the reaction takes place, the droplet itself experiences some kind of a buoyancy or the droplet density becomes smaller okay? and this density remains smaller for that long a time till the carbon monoxide bubble resides within the droplet itself. Actually people have collected these droplets from an LD converter, you know solidified, resolidified and then have sectioned it and observed that there are actually you know hollow spots within the tiny droplets itself confirming the theory that the carbon monoxide bubbles are generated in accordance with these or this you know within the droplet itself providing it an additional impetus to remain floated for a longer amount of time. How long these droplets can stay within the emulsion phase 2 to 3 and if you now plot the density of the droplet. So, a phase will come when the reactions carbon monoxide or carbon oxygen reaction will take place the droplet density is going to go down and then as the droplet is going to you know the carbon monoxide bubble eventually is going to be escaping because of the pressure differential then what happens is the droplet is now does not contain much carbon. Okay? There is no gas so the droplet density has now become heavier okay? and as a result of which this pure iron droplets okay, it will like to fall back to. So, a pure droplets suppose if this is the pure droplet now from which the carbon monoxide bubble has escaped. Okay. After spending about 2 to 3 minutes of residence time, finally this is the residence time of droplet. As carbon monoxide escapes from the droplet, the droplet experiences now an enhanced gravity because of its weight and the droplet falls down here into the melt. The droplet is now heavier than the hot metal if the hot metal is not refining. So, there is a segregation in the system okay, in the bulk of the liquid. So, the droplets will fall and the droplets of iron. So, you we can expect that you will have pure iron relatively you know you have concentrated uh, hot metal towards the upper part and the molten metal you know or pure uh, iron uh, which will be located towards. So, the droplets will come and droplets will undergo. Assuming that of course, if the droplet can come the droplet can you know because there is no carbon here carbon has been oxidized. So, it can get recarbonized also and there is a complex process so again it can go up and you know ultimately what I mean to say. So, there is going to be region here where carbon concentration is not going to be uniform because of the refining reactions taking place the upper part is going to be lower carbon and the you know higher carbon and the lower part is going to be lesser amount of carbon purified or refined droplets or metal is going to be seen towards the bottom and the undefined ones towards the. So, as it goes on and on so long as we are here there is no problem there is carbon monoxide evolving carbon oxygen reaction there is enough carbon in the bath, but imagine a scenario when the carbon has you know gone below a threshold. In that case you do not have the up thrust of the lot of carbon monoxide evaluation. So, the oxygen comes dissolves and then an oxygen is you know vertically deflected upward. So, this is the region when the oxygen is going to go up, but no carbon monoxide is being generated. Okay? Otherwise, the carbon monoxide is generated everywhere and that carbon monoxide is trying to leave because of the suction or the buoyancy of okay, a hot gas has a tendency to go up and as a result of which what happens is that there is a inherent force for suspending the slag metal droplet emulsions in the system. But this statement is true so long as there is enough carbon in the bath to sustain. Okay? The moment the carbon drop you know concentration falls below then the droplets is unsustainable. Okay? The, the emulsion is unsustainable the emulsion tends to now collapse. If the emulsion collapses then what happens slag metal reaction is going to come to us and actually the refining reactions are going to be very very slow because as I have indicated time and again that the bulk is not well starred the reaction rate of reaction in the bulk is no way comparable to the rate of reaction in the emulsion phases. And as a result of which what happens is our objective is that that you know we have to have 
So, before even the emulsion collapses, uh, we, we have to eliminate phosphorus, which uh, really require, you know, <coughs> which is important because once carbon concentration will fall below a certain level, critical level, uh, emulsion will not be sustained, and so it is no more possible to remove further phosphorus into the sieves. So, therefore, before the emulsion collapses in the system, or therefore, before carbon content drops to a below threshold value, lower than the threshold value, okay, we have to eliminate the phosphorus from the system. And that is ensured by you know fixing phosphorus with a very large basis tree in the system. Okay. So, therefore, we have to quickly remove phosphorus and then only phosphorus removal rate has to cannot lag behind uh, the carbon removal rate. Okay, then, then you will not be able to get to the desired phosphorus level. Phosphorus has to eliminate right from the beginning and you know phosphorus has to eliminate at a very quick rate. Of course, fortunately phosphorus has very small value, not as much as 4.3 percent carbon, but only have about 1.15 or 0.2 at the most wet percentage in hot metal itself. So, therefore, as we say that yes, we have the phosphorus removal you know taking place is completed before the emulsion collapses or by the time the steady decarburization period is over, we are you know the chemistry indicates sampling indicates that we have been able to, but it is not so easy. I have said it very easily, but controlling you know the operator has to play uh, with lot of parameters in the system and the hot metal temperature, oxygen blowing rate, the way we blow oxygen etcetera, these are all going to be very very important. Now, we must know that the operator has you know many control models, there are dynamic control models and uh, static control models, particularly the static control models tell us uh, which are used you know a prior day before a heat is started uh, that uh, you know if you want to if your target basis it is 3.5, so much of silicon is there, so much of MNO is there, how much of lime you have to you know. So, you, you calculate this through material balances. So, you have material balance you know material and enthalpy balance expressions available to you which are written in a computer program. You just run those computer programs given the hot metal temperature, given the hot metal amount okay, the program a static control or charge control model will tell you um, in a less than a minute that how much of lime needs to be charged, okay, uh, what should be the final temperature uh, of the melt and so on and so forth. But it will not how much of oxygen will be necessary, but it will not tell you that at what rate you have to pump in oxygen. Okay. The total amount of oxygen required is a thermodynamic requirement and that can be calculated from material balance, but you will not be able to know that at what rate. Okay. These are dynamic parameters at what rate it is not a constant rate at which oxygen is supplied. Okay. Now, decarb steady state decarburization for example, okay, for as I say when the rate of supply of oxygen matches with the rate of carbon monoxide formation that is the period when we reach steady state uh, decarburization period. So, these are you know the concept of time tells us that kinetics will provide necessary clue to these parameters and therefore, <coughs> you know uh, we have a dynamic model also which goes along with the process. Static control models have nothing to do you can sit in your room and you can do the calculation if I tell you my heat is 300 ton okay, hot metal temperature is this uh, you know uh, final carbon required is this uh, final silicon required is this and you calculate that how much of material I have to charge into the system. So, all this heat and material balance calculations can be turned through a, it is not a it is a trivial exercise actually for the steel plant uh, people. Now, on this we want to superimpose our last line. So, phosphorus we have done. So, this is our phosphorus and the fourth element is the manganese okay. and manganese also as you know we have seen that uh, we have manganese elimination basically it does not change much and then something like this the manganese. And we know that uh, we have because manganese oxidation as we have indicated that the moment initially the manganese I would say uh, oxidize a little bit uh, this curve will be something like. So, if you start from 1.5 itself. So, it changes and then it drops down. Okay. So, in this particular period we have for example, uh, you know uh, as we have indicated we have a large basicity, uh, but that in this case we have we get we can get some manganese removal towards the end because uh, FeO content is large 
and as I have indicated that when I talk about the manganese reaction that M n has a manganese has a greater affinity somewhat greater affinity towards oxygen, but because the oxidizing potential is very large and therefore, some amount of manganese removal is possible, but manganese does not spontaneously remove because you have a high carbon content in the bath and that you have a large basicity. So, there are more unfavorable conditions okay, and therefore, you do not see a silicon sort of a curve for manganese because for silicon there is lime sitting okay, in the system um, in the slag which will absorb the silica and also you have initially low relatively low temperature. So, the silicon reduction is completed there is no chance of any silicon re reversion to the metal because lime has fixed silicon uh, silica uh, silicon as silica as forming calcium silicate or dicalcium tricalcium silicate whatever it may be. In this case as you can understand as I have indicated here that the slag chemistry changes quite a bit. So, therefore, if you try to superimpose you know on a ternary diagram you will you will be able to take find out that the what is the slag chemistry yesterday I think I have or in the last lecture last but one lecture I have shown you a try you know a ternary diagram and you will be able to now see you know CaO SiO2 that during the process of the blow in the 20 minutes how the slag what is the composition of the slag how it changes you will be able to supervise. So, whatever I have shown here is basically if you have been you know successful to have uh, what do you call uh, sort of some percentage of magnesium and at temperature. So, this is the liquid region if you look at my last lecture and if you have been able to get liquid slag then it is you just not one. So, in the 20 periods of blow that is how maybe you know uh, the slag composition uh, will be changing as far as the four components are concerned. So, and also we must understand that the slag volume will also be evolving quite a bit and finally, the slag will be volume will be changing more or less monotonically okay, uh, just like the way I have shown the oxygen. Uh, so, the temperature as well as the slag volume will slag volume will also follow the trend which is dictated by the dissolved oxygen content. So, in the basic oxy in the Bessemer process for example, uh, you know in the Bessemer process there was no emulsion phase, but there is bottom stirring. So, the stirring really causes caused the uh, dephosphorization reaction, but in Bessemer process because not much heat is available initially because it is not a pure oxygen jet it is air jet which is injected from the bottom and that lot of heat is being carried away by nitrogen. So, what happens in the Bessemer process the phosphorus line was like this for some amount of time there is no phosphorus this is the trend and then the phosphorus removal will start, okay, but may not be at that particular rate. But initially for about 5 minutes 7 minutes there will be hardly any phosphorus because you do not have much heat available lot of heat has been taken away by nitrogen. The lime has not been dissolving because the temperature is not so large. So, the lime rich lag slag cannot be formed and therefore, in the Bessemer process you would see that phosphorus removal and carbon removal are not concurrent, but in Bessemer in the oxygen steel making process such as the LD steel making process we see a concurrent removal of sulf phosphorus okay, along with carbon in the whole process and actually uh, most of the operators play with the parameters in such a way that before carbon is eliminated all the phosphorus is removed and is sitting in the slag. The biggest challenge now is that having moved the phosphorus into the slag do not do anything wrong such that you will be able to get you will get back the phosphorus or phosphorus reversion takes place. And as I have indicated that if my temperature also increases like this which follows the you know of the bath. So, as with the increase of oxygen if you the temperature is going to be increasing and as a result of which what happens is there is a great danger of oxygen uh, phosphorus reversion from the slag itself. Okay. So, this is could be a these are all schematic values I just wanted to you know show you the trend. Uh, so, that you understand that how and why uh, you know the carbs are having a different kind of uh, shapes why silicon you know monotonically decreases, but on the other hand okay, the manganese line follows a different trend phosphorus and carbon line also you know <coughs> the 
films are much more sharper uh, you know than the manganese line itself. Why these are happening uh, that is hidden within this particular area itself within you know the drawing that I have provided here. So, the objective here is that towards the end of the blow. So, now if you imagine if you go to 20 if you do not know the end point and suppose you have blown 2 minutes extra you can imagine that this temperature is going to go you know somewhere here and this line also. I was fortunate to do some measurements in a steel plant and uh, where you know only ha half a minute uh, you know oxygen was blown into the metal extra more you know just for the sake of trial and getting some knowledge and it was demonstrated you know uh, by how many degrees the temperature of the bath increases. So, a 2 minutes of over blowing this period is called. So, this is the this target blowing end and this is what you have blown. So, this 2 minutes is the over blowing period if you have over blown in that case the slag will contain a few. So, if slag contains more a few that means there is going to be yield loss because slag is going to be thrown. You wanted to make steel and not slag. Similarly, if the temperature is going to be higher because of the FEO formation, then you can see that you will have chances of phosphorus reversion into the system. This phosphorus which you have been able to eliminate, you know, with so much of judicious planning as well as process control, okay, ahead of removal of carbon. And now the price is that because you cannot control the end point phosphorus, a large proportion of phosphorus has reversed back into the metal phase itself. Now, therefore, the end point control is very, very important uh, for us and where from the knowledge of end point control comes? The end point control information is hidden in the decarburization graph. So, in many in and these are all going to be you know <coughs> plant specific every converter uh, depending on its blowing practice and design will have a characteristic decarburization graph, but nonetheless the net general trend is going to be same. Okay. If the again you have said 5 minutes, you have said 10 minutes, the same one 15 minutes and then you have 20 minutes, okay. then we will see that the decarburization graph schematically can be this is an idealized curve. do not think that this is possible like this. So, get. so I'll draw. that is what it is. This is an idealized decarburization graph and this is what that you have a constant decarburization rate. Oh, this is time. This graph refers to this particular period where we have a straight line okay the carbon removal curve can be approximated so steady decarburization i am not giving the value and what i said that every converter will have a characteristic graph like this but the value of the steady state decarburization rate may be you know the rate at which particularly it is changing initially could be different this rate also could be different the steady decarburization rate of course you know uh, will attain a constant uh, value but the spread of the line etc depending on the blow some somewhere the blow could be about 40 minutes. So, the spread is going to be different. So, each converter is going to have a characteristic decarburization graph. If you look at this, so therefore, you could there are two important points which are very important that this is the end of the steady decarburization period and roughly somewhere here you can say last you know you can see the line. So, you can say this is the point. So, this is about say if you say 17 minutes say or 16 minutes that is the period in a 20 minutes of blow last 4 minutes and that is the period you have to tighten your belt because you want to now control the process you want to pinpoint the end blow time that when you have to shut off the oxygen and declare that the heat desired chemistry has been obtained. So, if this is your 16 or 17 seconds you can see that uh, from 17 to 20 seconds and this essentially tells us maybe that uh, you know this as I said this is an idealized representation actual graph may be a little bit deviated from. Uh, <coughs> so, the decarburization rate 
is continuously decreasing decarburization rate and this is consistent with the nature of the graph this I have drawn to be like this. So, that is the last tail end of the decarb you know, carbon concentration graph and this is consistent with this particular figure that the rate of decarburization as a function of time is decreasing. Now, the decarburization for example, d t as you all know that decarburization and I have indicated is a mass transfer controlled process is a first order process in steel making. So, you can say the rate constant multiplied by c. So, now we must understand that what is uh, you know. So, this concentration for example, if it is known now this graph how can you establish let us answer this part question particularly first. So, by taking the sample from steel bath you will be able to find out what is the concentration if you take measure carbon in the melt as a function of time this graph can be constructed easily there is no dispute about it okay. by sampling the belt we will be able to find out the carbon removal graph as I have indicated under belt composition. Once you have done that carb is approximated now you can use a software okay, to calculate the slope of the carb at this particular point at this particular point at this particular point at this particular point so on and so forth and that is how you plot the slope of the line that you have determined. So, carbon you have concentration of carbon you have determined as a function of time obtain that particular graph and then once you have done that graph you know you have used a, a software in order to find out the slope of the line at different time. So, these are the slope that you have you know gotten at this particular time at this particular time at this particular time and by joining the all these points you have constructed the characteristic decarburization curve for your. So, now so this point is known to us that we know that up to 17 percent 17 minutes the carbon concentration decarburization rate is constant and at 17 minutes suppose we say we look at this graph which you have measured we know that this is suppose I am saying 0 0.4 weight percentage carbon what I mean to say that this is a known value for us because we have made elaborate measurements of carbon concentration. So, we know at t is equal to 17 at <coughs> c is equal to 0 0.04 carbon concentration is. So, this is my initial condition as because this is an now if you want to write dc over dt. So, this is this equation integrated form will yield one in constant of integration and because now my target is this this is the zone I am interested in I am not interested here now this is <coughs> I want to control the end point and therefore, this is the time span 17 to 20 minutes is the time span. And this is suppose the C desired value and what we have obtained here suppose it may not be 0 here suppose this is 20 minutes is the carbon which is desired value. And we can say that that is the equilibrium value equilibrium means what with respect to the dissolved oxygen value. Okay. So, that is our desired value and we want to establish we want to achieve that desired value you know which is there is a slag metal equilibrium and there is equilibrium of the dissolved carbon with oxygen. So, we have T is equal to what is that and I need what C is equal to either I will denote C equilibrium or I will say which is C desired which I have just not explained that is what is the task that I know this information from my measurements you tell me the time when I will get to C equilibrium and that C equilibrium will vary from hit to hit. For example, you can use you know medium carbon grade steel then C equilibrium is going to be some value you can use low carbon grade then it is going to be some value. So, we can now say that this is the C which is changing as a function of time and then we have the driving force is C equilibrium or C desired that is the driving force 
this is what it controls carbon removal. Now, we can integrate this equation and then find out that you know using this initial condition this is going to be applicable to you because the moment we integrate it and then we can establish the integrated form of the equations. And this equation can be used provided the rate constant is given to us and the rate constant can be determined because we have established this particular graph and that I am going to discuss in the next lecture. We are almost done with the dynamics of the steel making process, LD steel making process maybe half an hour or so will be needed to you know wind up this and go to other oxygen steel making process.